The summer of 1998 was one of the hottest on record in North America. It was also the first time the public heard about a new environmental threat. The Earth is warmer in 1988 than at any time in the history of instrumental measurements. In testimony before Congress, NASA scientist James Hansen claimed that the greenhouse effect was already changing the climate. Alarms were also sounded at an international climate conference in Toronto. Ainsi a-t-on appris qu'une augmentation de quelques degrés seulement des températures du globe pouvait faire plusieurs milliers de victimes dans certains coins de la Terre. Policymakers must now take heed and take up actions that they have ignored too long. We have come to a threshold. If we cross this threshold, we may not be able to return. Officials in Exxon's U.S. headquarters were concerned. A few weeks after this testimony, a company memo circulates that lays out what would become the company's corporate strategy for years to come. Burning fossil fuels, which releases greenhouse gases, the document says, could become one of the biggest environmental issues of the 1990s. And this surprising sentence, which says that the company should emphasize the scientific uncertainty around the issue of global warming and the role that greenhouse gases play. Exxon knew decades ago that its products could be a threat to the climate. Et lorsque vous me mettez dans les mains, c'est la preuve qu'ils étaient à l'avance de bien des chercheurs qui travaillaient dans le domaine à cette époque-là. But the company kept raising doubts about global warming. They engaged in an intentional campaign of deception. They lied. A sort of double speak whose impact would reach all the way to Canada. So this is where I keep it, my old helmet. And this is the coveralls I wore. Memories of an exciting time for Ed Garvey. It was 1979, and he just completed his bachelor's degree in engineering. He soon found himself aboard the Esso Atlantic, an Exxon tanker that sailed the Gulf of Mexico. It reminds me of a, of a really fun time in my life. I had a wonderful time, a really challenging, intellectually stimulating time working there, doing all this uh, design of the equipment and doing the design of the, getting the instrumentation to work, taking these new measurements of carbon dioxide no one had ever done before. Monitoring, monitoring the oceans. So it brings back very fond memories. Working for Exxon was a great place to work, and it was very forward-looking. Their research and engineering company was among the best in the world. At the time, Garvey ran a project that sought to understand the role the oceans played in absorbing carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas. A laboratory was set up on this ocean giant. So the Exxon shows the fourth largest ship in the world. It was huge, uh, essentially a floating island. It was something that a large portion of the corporation was involved in. It was a busy time for Exxon scientists. They were doing groundbreaking research on renewable energy, including solar panels and lithium batteries. They were also working on climate models. It was a defensive issue, but it wasn't, it wasn't one of hiding the problem. It was one of we realize this is going to be a problem for the fossil fuel industry, and we want our scientists to be contributors because we want our opinions to be heard at the table when the discussions begin on what to do about it. Moi, je suis un peu tombée dans les changements climatiques comme Obélix dans la potion magique parce que je voulais faire un doctorat aux États-Unis en écologie. Hola! Catherine Potvin studied plants in the early 1980s, which led her to eventually study climate science. The biologists traveled to the jungles of Panama to study how plants reacted to increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. C'était quand même une problématique qui était connue. Donc, il y avait quand même beaucoup de chercheurs un peu partout dans le monde qui essayaient à la fois de comprendre, OK, ce gaz-là change dans sa concentration. Pourquoi? Puis quel est le lien de ça avec la biosphère? Puis quel est le lien de ça avec le climat? Exxon scientists were at the cutting edge of this research. This memo sent to company managers in 1982 was one of the documents unearthed by investigative journalists in the U.S. 
This graph predicts with great accuracy the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations and temperatures that we see today. Je vous passe ça. Puis ça, c'est un document de 1982 envoyé au management d'Exxon euh, aux États-Unis. Oui, il était sur la coche. Il en savait plus que bien des scientifiques. Vous en saviez pas tant que ça en 1982? Moi, je, probablement que je connaissais moins précisément les projections des modèles climatiques que ce qu'eux disent ici. Et là, ce que vous me mettez dans les mains, c'est la, la preuve qu'ils étaient à l'avance de bien des chercheurs qui travaillaient dans le domaine à cette époque-là. Citing several experts, the memo says that global warming could have catastrophic impacts. And by the time those impacts are measurable, they could be irreversible. The company was already trying to measure these effects in Canada. L'Imperial Oil Limited est fier du rôle prépondérant qu'elle a joué dans l'exploitation pétrolière au Canada. Exxon's subsidiary Imperial Oil, also known as ESSO, has been in Canada for over 140 years. The product he uses to service your car, bear the ESSO name that is known near and far. It was considered Canada's premier brand of gasoline. L'Imperial Oil a amorcé dès 1964 un vaste programme d'exploration dans l'Arctique canadien. Après avoir consacré 10 années et plus de 100 millions de dollars, elle a trouvé de grands gisements d'énergie pétrolière. The company is a pioneer in Arctic exploration, and it even built artificial islands to extract oil. While Exxon, its parent company, insisted on the uncertainty of climate change science, Imperial was more worried about the possible impacts of global warming in the Arctic in the late 1980s. It commissioned a study to see whether melting permafrost could harm its pipeline projects in the Mackenzie River Valley in the Northwest Territories. The company worked closely with Environment Canada on a groundbreaking climate research project. Stuart Cohen was in charge of this study. The study area includes Northeast BC, Northern Alberta, Northwest Saskatchewan, and pretty much the entire Mackenzie Valley right up to the Beaufort Sea. It was already identified in the 1980s that the Mackenzie Valley region was warming faster than any other part of the country. So that was raising interest for that reason. Cohen and his team decided to join forces with Imperial Oil. They understood how important it was. They wanted to be part of the project. They contributed their expertise. They contributed financial support. So they were quite serious about it, and uh, I very much appreciated their support. The relationship was going really well, probably until about late 1992. But one day, Stewart had trouble getting a hold of his contact at Imperial. Without much warning, um, they dropped out. What happened? They just disappeared one day, stopped answering your phone calls? Yeah, or That's kind of what happened, exactly. And I think it was clearly not the choice of the technical staff that I was working with. They didn't want to do this. They were told, uh, sorry, you have to drop out of this project. My main contact there uh, privately told me that, yes, this was an executive order to not engage anymore on climate change research. Stuart Cohen saw a troubled industry that was at a crossroads. I think there were some people in the energy industry that saw that as a sign that their industry would be under threat and they were going to need to deal with it in some way. And unfortunately, they made a choice which was to fight the science. This Premier Minister and Minister of the Environment. J'étais contente, je voulais être ministre de l'environnement, euh, mais probablement j'étais un peu naïf aussi. I, Sheila Copps, do swear that I will be faithful. Parce que je connaissais moins euh, comment le gouvernement du Canada dépendait sur les revenus de, des pétroliers. When Sheila Copps was appointed Minister of the Environment in 1993, her mission was clear, to follow through on the commitments made a year earlier by Canada in Rio. The international community mobilized on the climate change file in the early 1990s. It was a busy period that eventually culminated in the Earth Summit in Rio. To continue along this pathway, 
could lead to the end of our civilization. L'homme d'après Rio doit aussi aimer le monde. Tout cet environnement naturel que nous détruisons régulièrement. Conference participants adopted the first framework convention on climate change, although there were no binding measures. À l'époque, on parlait beaucoup du principe de précaution. Quand on pense qu'il y a un danger possible, on est mieux de prévenir que de faire face à la catastrophe. To fulfill the promises made by the previous Mulroney government in Rio, the Liberal Party set ambitious goals. By 2005, Canada was going to reduce greenhouse gases by 20% from 1988 levels. Quand je me suis rendu à ma première réunion avec mon sous-ministre, il m'a dit, Madame, vous... parce que j'ai dit, on a, on, a, on a mis ce promesse de, de 20%. Il dit, Madame, ça, c'est la politique. Maintenant, vous êtes dans le gouvernement. Le gouvernement n'a pas la politique. Alors même que vous avez fait cette promesse-là, oubliez-le, parce que vous ne l'aurez pas. Ça, c'était mon sous-ministre qui m'a dit ça. But before continuing with Sheila Copps' story, it's crucial to understand what was going on in the American oil industry. Developments there would impact Canada. In the 1990s, the oil companies were getting organized. The scientific data tell us that there is no global warming that we can detect. What scientists are debating is whether there might be a future warming. Industry-funded scientists attacked the emerging consensus on climate change, and they argued against regulations. Please welcome our chairman, Lee Raymond. Lee. With the arrival of Lee Raymond, the new CEO at Exxon, the rhetoric there grew more extreme. He insisted that we still didn't know whether human activity played a role in climate change. Many factors, he said, could be causing it. If we weren't here, the climate would change. It has to do with sunspots, it has to do with the wobble of the earth, it has, it has, there are all kinds of things that come and go. The scientific record, even in the late 70s and early 80s, was enough to dismiss that argument. That's just failure to understand the science. It's, I mean, this is denial. In the early 90s, Imperial Oil's approach was more nuanced than that of its parent company. Imperial pointed to the economic risks of possible government regulations on climate change, but it publicly acknowledged that climate change was real. George Green worked for Imperial Oil in the 1970s. He later went on to work on environmental issues for the federal government. There is on the record Imperial Oil speaking to an acknowledgement of climate science in the early 90s, uh, that it is likely real we have warming climate and that it will likely have impacts. But during Sheila Copps's tenure as Minister of the Environment, Imperial's position would gradually align with Exxon's. Despite everything it knew about climate change, the company's public position was about to shift drastically. A number of us saw what we call a progressive and I'll use a funny term, exonization of the company. Not just in wearing gray suits, but actually in policy positions. Exxon doesn't accept that climate is going to affect its business. And I think got transferred more and more to Canada, to the Canadian operations. A former senior Imperial Oil executive with strong industry ties confirmed to us that starting in 1995, the company's environmental policies were largely dictated by the head office in Texas and that words like sustainable development were now banned. Un des premiers conseils qu'on vous avait donné, c'était de vous rendre au meeting de ce qui s'appelait le Friday Group. Oh, oui, oui, oui. <laughs> Sheila Cobb soon discovered that lobbyists and major industry representatives, especially Imperial Oil, played a key role in the Friday Group. Il voulait que je rejoigne à ce groupe pour savoir c'est quoi les pensées de, de l'autre côté. Mais ce qui est drôle, c'est que le Friday Group, il y en avait les, les, euh, les industrialistes, mais on n'avait jamais de Friday Group des, euh, des environnementalistes. This informal group met often, and politicians were invited. But according to Sheila Copps, the Friday Group mainly served as a way for industry to organize against environmental regulations. J'ai fait deux, trois réunions. J'ai dit, je ne veux plus en faire parce que c'est un perte de mon temps. Je ne peux pas la convaincre quoi que ce soit. 
Puis eux, ils veulent juste me faire pression de ne rien faire. Cops also saw that industry was backed by parts of the government, namely the Ministry of Natural Resources. They had much more influence at the cabinet table. Sheila Cops and Environment Canada were isolated. Si j'étais supposée d'aller devant le cabinet pour avoir un mandat de réduction pour les changements climatiques, c'est les, les, les sous-ministres qui se réunissaient pour essayer comment est-ce qu'on peut freiner ça. Et eux, ils travaillaient avec les, les lobbyistes. One of COP's biggest battles was over introducing voluntary measures as a way to get major industries to reduce their emissions. COPs fought for strong regulations, while Industry Canada and Natural Resources Minister Ag McLellan argued for a voluntary approach. We're not going to achieve the goal if we do, you know, if we put a gun to our heads and blow our brains out in terms of the economic underpinnings of our country. It was at this time that Imperial Oil, like its U.S. parent company Exxon, started questioning the science surrounding climate change, creating doubt and confusion on this issue. In the National Archives in Canada, we found this letter from 1994 sent by the CEO of Imperial to several ministers. The scientific uncertainty surrounding climate change, he says, calls for government restraint. Too much intervention would risk creating social and economic damage. The question was, how can we reduce greenhouse gases while protecting the economy? And no one was working on that. We were all trying to pull from one side or the other. Avram Lazar worked as a senior official at Environment Canada in the 1990s. He was in charge of the climate change file. It was a complete failure on climate change because industry sensed that the government wasn't ready to act. And they were right. We haven't acted yet. According to COPS, one of the reasons the government was so slow to act was a huge army of industry lobbyists. C'est sûr que ils couvrent plus le terrain. Et l'autre question que nous avions abordé, évidemment, c'est la question de si les revenus viennent de ce groupe-là, très fortement dans les coffres du gouvernement, mais ça crée euh, pas mal de problèmes pour avoir le courage de se retirer de ces profits. In 1995, industry in the province of Alberta won out. The government put in place a voluntary registry for emissions with no hard targets or timelines. Je sais que l'industrie, informellement, a écrit une lettre au premier ministre en disant que j'étais trop déraisonnable et je dois être déplacé par un autre. Vraiment? Oui, 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 oui. Three years after arriving at Environment Canada, Sheila Copps would be shuffled out. That posting was one of the most difficult of her career. You want to talk about the climate change? Yeah, climate change. yeah, no, I don't want to talk about climate change. Quand j'étais à l'intérieur et je luttais, oui, ça me faisait vraiment frustrer parce que nous avions promis de faire ces choses-là. Failed government efforts meant that almost a decade was lost. But the real battle was still to come. And Imperial would adopt an increasingly climo-skeptic line. I happen to agree with the people on the green side, but I, I, I don't think it's illegitimate for industry to represent its interests. Now, if they lie, if they misrepresent the facts, if they skew the facts, that is unethical and it's politically illegitimate. David Anderson was Federal Minister of the Environment for only 10 days. But his mandate was clear, to advance the climate change file. As a newly minted minister, he traveled to Calgary in August of 1999 to meet with representatives of the oil and gas industry. He expected a laid-back social gathering. This was a get-together, get-to-know-you, uh, hello session. It was not um, meant to be a substantive discussion of scientific issues. But he was surprised by the attitude of one of the participants who immediately attacked him on climate change. He simply was saying the science is wrong. Uh, we know because we have the uh, uh, scientists, the intellectual capacity to tell you it's wrong. He was so belligerent 
in our initial meeting that I really had little interest in another meeting with him because I, well, I was, <laughs> was going to get punched around the room. The man doing the punching was Bob Peterson, then CEO at Imperial Oil. After having climbed the corporate ladder, he took charge in 1992. After his arrival, former employees told us there was a hardening, a nexonization of the company's stance on the issue of climate change. Uh, we more than doubled the business uh, activity from Northern Firms. Our employment targets were well exceeded. Robert Peterson was one of the most ardent promoters of the oil sands in the 1970s and 80s. Their enormous potential has long been known, but new technologies were making them cheaper to exploit. In the early 2000s, Imperial Oil, along with other companies, invested billions of dollars in this new El Dorado. And it was good news for shareholders. You know, I think it was Sophie Tucker who once observed, I've been rich and I've been poor, and rich is better. The trouble was that despite industry efforts to make the oil sands less polluting, a barrel of tar sand oil was much worse for the climate than a barrel of conventional oil. A fact that directly clashed with Canada's greenhouse reduction targets. Ça faisait des décennies que le Canada avait décidé que son avenir économique c'était les sables bitumineux. Là, il y a comme un gros problème avec les sables bitumineux et le Canada, évidemment, pas été très enthousiaste et n'est toujours pas très enthousiaste face au problème principal que le pays auquel le pays doit faire face. The eyes of the world are upon us now. In 1997, the international community met in Kyoto to tackle climate change. The stakes this time were high. Countries were hoping to negotiate the first binding agreement meant to reduce greenhouse gases. President Clinton and I will be hard at work behind the scenes. Like the other countries who signed on, Canada needed to develop a real plan to achieve its climate change goals. Mr. Chrétien put me in environment with the instructions to make sure I did something about uh, getting ratification of the Kyoto Accord. Just find out what we can do now. Well, and that's when I went out on speaking tours and other things to drum up support. As David Anderson began to pitch the new climate plan across the country, opponents of the deal were quick to organize. And one of Kyoto's most implacable critics was Imperial Oil's Bob Peterson. We, we oppose Kyoto. We think it's a silly public policy. It's inappropriate, unworkable, and really should be reconsidered by the government of Canada. But Imperial Oil's boss would go even further. He systematically spread doubt about the science that underpinned global warming like he did in his first meeting with Minister Anderson. Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, but an essential ingredient for life on this planet, he wrote in the company magazine in 1998. The link, he says, between the burning of fossil fuels and climate change remains an unproven hypothesis. So in a way, he went against his former, the company's former policy position. Uh, he himself questioned the science on climate and whether human activity was impacting it or whether it was natural variation. So there was a shift. And I, to be honest, I cannot tell whether that shift was his own view and where he wanted Imperial Oil to go or whether this was now Exxon starting to have its imprint. At the height of the debates over the Kyoto Accord in 2002, Imperial Oil and other companies funded a conference of known climate skeptics. The Kyoto Accord, they said, was one-sided and based on unproven arguments. The rationale for Kyoto is unsubstantiated and biased. It damages the economy and doesn't do any good. You know, why do it? For me, there's something that's fundamentally malhonnête to always try to say that there needs to be more knowledge. It's sure that, as a researcher, I say, there needs to be more knowledge. We will always be able to make our models more precise. Mais dès le début des années 2000, on savait qu'il y avait un problème. What we did not know is that while Imperial was publicly casting doubt on climate change, internally it was taking it very seriously. In 1996, Imperial was part of a consortium of companies building the Sable project off the coast of Nova Scotia. 
they adjusted the height of that offshore oil rig to take into account for the rise in sea level caused by global warming. We asked Imperial Oil about Sable and their stance on climate change in the early 2000s. They told us that their position at the time reflected the evolving debate on climate science and policies to reduce emissions. But at the time, it was not just Imperial Oil that fought against Kyoto. Much of the Canadian business class did as well. And they attacked it with nationalist and economic arguments. In October 2002, a new catchphrase, a Made in Canada solution, was put forth. Imperial Oil CEO was among the first to use it. We deserve a Canadian approach that produces immediate results and invests in our environmental future. The tagline was used as part of an aggressive campaign launched by several industries. It would soon become popular amongst many politicians. So a Made in Canada approach. A Made in Canada plan. A Made in Canada solution. It created a lot of confusion, but that was the point. A poll released at the time shows that support for Kyoto went down with 45% of respondents saying the government should favor a Made in Canada solution instead of Kyoto. We had um, very strong support across the country and it went down later as a result of the campaign of the industry. But despite opposition, in December 2002, David Anderson saw his efforts rewarded after his hard-fought battle. That's one of the high points of my time in politics. I worked pretty well full-time on climate change issues. We get about 60% or more of the vote. So I rush over and shake Mr. Chrétien's hand because he had been very supportive. Despite its good environmental talk, out west, Canada was set on developing its tar sands. And the industry said, well, give us some certainty on the price. We've done that. And the Minister of Natural Resources reassured the oil industry. The costs of Kyoto would remain minimal, and the government would make sure of that. A month later, the country's biggest oil company, Suncor, said these additional costs represented only 20 to 27 cents per barrel of oil, a price they said was, quote, negligible. This is a critical issue uh, of vast importance. It may well lead to substantial loss of human life. So I am angry when this is thwarted by people looking only for a very short-term interest of expansion of a company for 10, 20 or 30 years. Between 1995 and 2004, oil sand production would more than double. It is a bucolic view, boats entering and leaving Vancouver. But these ships are often laden with oil. For Tsipora Berman, this fuel is a key part of the climate threat, and she has dedicated her life to fight against it. Prime Minister Harper had done a speech in the UK that I'll never forget, where he, we are all just coming to grips with climate change. The oil sands are the second largest oil deposit in the world. Zipporah Berman left Canada to lead Greenpeace International's climate change program. But in 2012, worried about the massive growth in the tar sands, she decided to return to Canada. Everyone was starting to realize how serious climate change is. And Prime Minister Harper stood up in the UK and announced that Canada was going to become an energy superpower. In short, it is an enterprise of epic proportions, akin to building the pyramids or China's Great Wall, only bigger. In the early 2000s, the oil sands became the bête noire of environmentalists and celebrities. The pressure only increased after Stephen Harper's Conservative government pulled Canada out of the Kyoto Accords. All I could think about was Canada and the debates that were happening in the oil sands. Working with a small team, Zipora Berman attempted to do what no one in 25 years achieved, reach an agreement with industry to limit the development of the tar sands in Alberta. 
She had done this with the forest industry. Are you going to ask them to come off the equipment? You'll have to ask them yourself. These people are not criminals, and they should not be going to jail. The people who should be going to jail right now are destroying Plaquemut Sound as we stand here. I was arrested and charged with 857 counts of criminal aiding and abetting, and I faced six years in jail. I was 23. Eventually, the two sides agreed to meet. The dialogue that ensued led to a historic agreement that preserved much of BC's rainforest. A contact tried to put Berman in touch with members of the oil industry so she could try and reach a deal with them. A meeting was organized with the president of their association. We had, you know, really some of the most fascinating conversations I've ever had. If you agree with climate science, what do you think our fair share is? What should Canada be doing? Other environmental groups and Canada's five largest oil companies soon joined these discussions. These secret meetings took place mostly in private dining rooms. For the oil companies, the idea that they would be meeting with me and other environmentalists, you know, they were traitors. And it would have been an explosive story. Imperial Oil came to some of these early meetings, but the dialogue with them didn't last. At one point, they came and said, our, our US office, our head office, won't let us continue these conversations. And they said, um, we will not be on the edge of pushing government to have stronger climate policy. I don't know. I think, I think we might have made a little bit of history tonight. The election of an NDP government in 2015 in Alberta was a political revolution and the NDP wanted to tackle climate change. Discussions that started with Tsipora Berman's group were taken up by the provincial government. And in November 2015, Alberta struck a landmark agreement to limit oil sands development. The room was electric. People were crying. I actually never thought I would see this day. It was, it was pretty exciting. This is the day we stop denying there is an issue. And this is the day we do our part. In addition to setting a cap on greenhouse gas emissions, something which had never been done before, the agreement included a carbon tax on gasoline along with the phase out of coal. But for Rich Kruger, the new boss at Imperial Oil, this went too far. He opposed an overall emissions cap and the deal created a schism within the industry. Oh, I heard that there was a lot of yelling meetings on the industry side. But I would speculate that given Exxon's position on climate change at the time, Imperial Oil would not be in a position to join that coalition. And they had large expansion plans. This cap, which Imperial rejected, was very generous, according to former Environment Minister David Anderson. For instance, uh, they were allowed substantially more emissions from oil and gas than um, they were at that point emitting. For Tsipora Berman, this agreement represented a first step. It was not enough to align Canada's emissions or Alberta's emissions with Paris schools. It was not strong enough to constrain the production of the oil sands. But it was, it was strong climate policy. Strong policy, perhaps, but the Notley government would never pass rules implementing an emissions cap. And during the election campaign that followed, the agreement and Sephora Berman herself were fiercely attacked. Alberta is open for business. The Conservatives were elected in 2019, and all hope for major action on climate change in Alberta disappeared. Greenhouse gas emissions increased by almost 20% in Canada since 1990. And production from the oil sands grew by 565% between 1992 and 2016. Good morning, everyone. In October 2019, a U.S. Congressional Committee held hearings into what it called the efforts of the oil industry to hide the truth about climate change. Ed Garvey, the former Exxon scientist, testified. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before the committee. This is an important message to know that the oil companies knew about this decades ago, that the, the denials and the things that have occurred since were not the case then. 
people were discussing how to deal with the climate change problem, not whether or not it existed or whether it was real or not. In an email, Exxon told us that claims regarding its climate research are inaccurate and deliberately misleading. Cherry-picked statements attributed to a small number of employees wrongly suggest definitive conclusions were reached decades ago. Exxon adds that they won their first lawsuit in New York State, though this was a narrow case where the company was accused of having misled shareholders on the true cost of climate change. Exxon cites the judge in the case who said that trial testimonies demonstrated Exxon has a culture of disciplined analysis, planning, accounting, and reporting. But about 20 other lawsuits against Exxon and other oil companies are before the courts. Municipalities like Charleston accuse the company of deceiving the public about the true damage caused by their product. They engaged in an intentional campaign of deception. They lied. They lied to us about the impact of their products on climate change and that it would lead to sea level rise. Exxon really has a, just, just a huge corporation. It was the largest corporation in the world then. So I would see that as part of their role is to, yeah, to guide the industry. They were big enough that they could do it if they had chosen. George Green says that Imperial had a big influence on the debate in Canada. I think they used their weight uh, in either blocking or in changing consensus among their peers. That's really important. And that then affects, of course, lobbying and the view that's taken to government. I blame the industry, um, but I also blame the government for not curbing uh, Natural Resources Canada and other departments <laughs> who were uh, basically opposing climate change measures, thinking it's not in the interest of our clients, so we're not interested in it either. Imperial told us that it supports the Paris Agreement and is working with governments to reduce emissions at the lowest possible cost to society. Thanks to major investments in research, it says that it has already reduced its emissions per barrel of oil by 20%, and it plans to reduce them by another 10% by 2023. It was a disastrous year for Exxon and Imperial Oil. The COVID crisis and the fall of the price of oil hit the company hard. But ultimately, it may be the market itself that limits the company's growth in the oil sands. At the time, I believe that, you know, Imperial thought it was essential to have a united front against the attack of climate policy. Um, I think they've lost that fight. All of the major banks are saying Canada's oil sands will be one of the first oils to be netted off the market because it's the highest carbon and high cost. Not that long ago, Exxon was the most highly valued company on the stock market. First, the real shocker here is an oil company coming out and a cloud company coming in. In August of 2020, it was kicked out of the Dow Jones Index. For Catherine Potvin, there is no time to lose. C'est sûr qu'il y a deux avenues qui s'offrent à nous. Il y a l'avenue, OK, on va investir dans une reprise plus verte ou on va faire ce qu'on faisait avant. Je continue ma recherche fondamentale, mais, mais la prise de décision politique, l'action des gens, le, le, en parler pour que les gens comprennent l'urgence critique, terrifiante de ça, c'est devenu de plus en plus obsédant pour moi. 